So today we're having a, a conversation with Sharon Lindan, um, who's a member of St. John the Baptist, an uh, expert reader of scripture, as those of you who watch these services regularly will know. And um, Sharon, thank you so much for joining us uh, and, and agreeing to have this conversation with me. Thank you. And Sharon, you, you, um, we've had quite a few conversations or, or several conversations over the summer that have really stimulated me, challenged me and, and helped me in my own growth, um, especially since George Floyd's murder earlier in the summer. And, and we've reflected a couple of times on that. And the conversations have been so helpful to me that I, that's why I've invited you back to, um, to, to continue these discussions with others listening in, if you like. But for those who don't know you, um, can you just share a little bit about, about who you are, your family, your, your background? Okay. Um, I'm Sharon Linden. I'm, a, as Dave said, member of St. John the Baptist. I was born and actually brought up in Jamaica. And I left Jamaica when we got our green card to the US. There was a lot of political turmoil and there were a lot of Jamaicans leaving at the time. So we had aunts in the US, they sponsored us, went over there. Um, I disliked it, even though I had visited the US so much. Living there and visiting were two different things, but I was shocked at the, the, the it was a huge culture shock to me coming from a, an inclusive Jamaican environment because I was brought up on a university campus where we had English people, Indian people, all sorts of people from all over the world. And um, going to a very segregated America, even though I worked on Madison Avenue for a publication, a financial publication, I was feeling very different vibes, should I say. Then I came to England for a month or two. My cousin was a diplomat here. I was going to put down my suitcases and um, backpack around Europe. And instead I got a job at the Commonwealth Secretariat. And um, so I did my traveling, European travels during my holidays. Loved England, loved London. I thought this was great. I felt very inclusive immediately. Yeah, felt at home here. And then I went off to Norway for five years where I met my now ex-husband, but we're still very close. He just lives in High Wycombe. Mm -hmm. And um, we had a filia. We came back here and we had a filia. I went back to working for the Commonwealth Secretariat and um, uh, we moved to Marlow when a filia needed to go to school. So she went to school at Burford in Marlow Bottom. And it was absolutely lovely. I loved the area. I loved everyone. She fit in. I mean, I think this is a learning thing. When you bring up your child, you realize how important it is for them to feel like they fit into a crowd. So she was, I think as she grew up and became a teenager, she'd almost in a way overdo trying to fit in too hard, not being herself. But now that she's grown up and when she was a little baby, she was very, very proud of her Norwegian and Jamaican background. And now she's absolutely over the moon that she does have all these three influences, England, Norway, Jamaica. Wow, it's, it's a really um, amazing journey that you, you've been on, unique uh, journey to, through life. And, and you've, I mean, you're very, modest about it but I know you, you've you've had an incredibly successful working life can you just tell us a bit about where where you work now and yes um after the commonwealth secretariat I went into banking so I worked for two German banks one Swiss bank and now I'm at um an English bank and um I've loved it I especially loved how international it was how um it was always a challenge you were never bored. There was always new and better ways of doing things and new things to learn and changes, constant change. Sometimes it could be a bit unsettling because, you know, I've had a couple of redundancies and in the bad old days, they would um, give you, well, they'd call you up to the HR room and say they'd send a courier with your stuff and you'd have to go home. Wow. So, um, that's a major change. They don't normally do that to vicars. It's a world I'm not familiar with. 
but despite the, the the very competitive and and br sort of sometimes brutal nature of the work i know you, you've you've you know made it to quite a senior level in in the bank and um and i I'm, i know that you've spoken to me about about little milo church and what an incredibly uh, inclusive community that's been for you and anyone who's ever set foot in that church will know just how loving and wonderful the people are there and and I, I think one of the things that's challenged me this summer you know with with the black lives matter movement is that i think i'd always thought that as long as i was one of those people who is warm and welcoming and and sort of you know didn't treat people any differently depending on what their background or ethnicity or, or anything else then that was that was fine i was one of the good people but i think what you've helped me to see this summer and the, and the various things that i've read is that there's a huge amount of of hidden barriers there's a there's a huge amount of obstacles in the way of someone who isn't white in this country and in our society here in marlow even that that we if you're white you simply don't ever see those things and i mean i know you've spoken to me about things you've encountered at work that have were really shocking to me as a, as a white man i mean do you mind sharing maybe one, one of those stories now of the, the kind of yeah, the, the barriers that you've seen and the, the racism in the workplace. Yes, um, first I must correct you because I'm not senior. Um, and that's been one of the problems. I always felt that I never played the victim. Um, I felt if you worked hard, you were fair to people, you were good to people, which is another reason why I need, coming, need to keep coming to church <laughs> is just to remind myself every Sunday that I'm blessed, I'm luckier than most, and that I can do better and I should do better and be kinder and be a better person and give more and look outwards rather than inwards. And uh, I always felt that if I was fair and very friendly to people, that people would respond. And I think it was it was surprising in the culture um, that it wasn't necessarily so. Of course, you know we have they they are speaking about changing this, but there isn't a lot of fairness. Um, you would find people. Perhaps it was fair of their jobs. Perhaps they had been there. Perhaps they weren't properly educated. So they, they feared losing their jobs. So anyone new, younger, not that I was younger, but or more educated than they, are, they were, they would immediately have these my, what they call microaggressions, i.e., People would send you to the wrong meeting room. People would give you the wrong information. People would perhaps not be truthful in their assessments. So what you find is that perhaps if there's a level, if they are, you know, if they have a certain percentage of people of being background to hire, they won't move above that level because they're not given the chance, they're not given the support. You can send out emails, general emails, people won't answer you because they won't want your project to succeed. So they work together in order to create these barriers. And in the beginning, I thought, well, maybe it's just me, but I have friends in banking, I have friends in other organizations, and I've heard horrendous stories of people planting things on their desks, confidential things on their desks. I mean, the sort of things that you wouldn't believe would happen. But um, it's, yeah, it, it was disturbing. And naturally, it upsets you because you will always think it's just you. But you begin to look around the organization and you realize nobody is is going above that and people who want to move forward just leave the organization actually mm. so um yeah it's not as easy as you think well it is as easy as you think if you're white 
purely because of the color of your skin. And this is one of the things I'm learning is that, is that purely, you know, b because of the color of, of, of your skin, you, you face things that are, that the, I didn't even know happened yeah. or I thought didn't happen anymore. And I think as a church, you know, we hold is absolutely fundamental to our belief that all people are made in the image of God and that God has created this vast diversity of the human race and that each and every one is equally precious in his sight. And I think one of the, the things we need to learn how to do as a church is to dismantle and, and, and stand against anything that, that opposes that. And I, I think we have a huge way to go on that as a church. And I, I'm so grateful to you for helping me to un understand and see more clearly things that have been invisible to me you know for nearly half a century of my life and I, I hope that in the second half of my life I can play a bigger part in standing up for for change than I have done in the first and I hope that as a church we will travel that path together what, where, wherever Jesus takes us on it. Yes and you do already because I found the church very, very inclusive. And this is why you have such a, a fantastic um, populace within the church. It's, it's very inclusive. I've never felt left out. Well, that's wonderful to hear. And I look forward to hearing many, many more people discovering that in the church in, in Little Marlow, across our team, all, the, all around the country in the years ahead. So thank you so much, Sharon, for taking this time to share some of your story with us. And God bless you as you continue to, um, to, to live out your life and shine as a light in this dark world. And thank you. And God bless you as well, Dave. And thank you for having me.